welcome to Watches Live. Folks, it's the only show we film on the Watchbox Reviews channel. Thank you for joining me. I have everything on the table tonight from Grail watches in the six-figure range to timepieces you can take away from this table this evening for three figures in US dollars. In other words, we run the gamut. I promised you Audemars Piguet and A leads off the alphabet, so we may as well start with AP on the table. This evening, a grail watch by any definition. This is the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar, Contiem Perpetuel. This is 39 millimeters in an exquisite combination of platinum and stainless steel. So everything you see that's polished, note this is different from a conventional Royal Oak with a polished top and flank to the bezel. That's because everything polished here, with the exception of the white gold bezel bolts, is platinum. Now you'll see the same treatment down the bracelet. Everything that's polished, the center links, platinum. The watch is 39 millimeters in diameter, so this is traditional Royal Oak in the jumbo case size, as Genta intended, but it's wonderfully slim, only 9.2 millimeters thick, despite being automatic winding and a perpetual calendar. Now I'm going to flip this one over, and I'm going to pop open the clasp, and if we can, show a little bit of the case back because it uses a Audemars Piguet 2120 base. So it turns a perpetual calendar module. This is the famed ultra-thin automatic designed by JLC for Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, and Vacheron Constantin. For these perpetual calendars, Audemars Piguet builds it in-house, finishes it in-house, and then mates it with their own perpetual calendar module. It beats away at the quirky old beat rate of 19,000 800 vibrations per hour. It was all the rage in the 70s. This, though, very much a watch of the modern era. It has a mid-E serial number, which I believe dates the production to roughly 1998-1999. So relatively recent production. This is a model that started in 1981, the first Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar, and continues to this day. In fact, this very movement only recently passed out of production at AP. For a long time, the Royal Oak Perpetual was one thing and only one thing, and that works well because there is no planned obsolescence built into a watch like this. I may as well give you a wrist shot. You guys have been watching me wear this Zen EZM 1.1 for the last couple of days. You already know what it looks like on my arm. Okay, let's throw the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Jumbo perpetual calendar on the wrist. So this is the traditional 39 millimeter case. It's about 50 millimeters lug to lug, and you'll find that it sits very flat. It's a perfect match for any kind of a formal cuff, but because it has a black dial and a white metal case, it's also got an element of sportiness about it. So this is a very versatile look. If you look at the dial itself, my favorite refinement isn't that beautifully balanced perpetual calendar with its contrasting metallic registers. It's the applied white gold indices out board on the railroad minutes. That absolutely zings me. Love this watch. Okay. Guys, joining from around the world, I can see Russell996 first in, John Velez, Tom P, Fjord Prefect, Matt Foster, Andrew, SD12, Jorge Garcia, Papaz, Long Mac, John Smith, Flobber650, Jan Wilhelm Koster, and I can see Pilot Style123 joining us from Ireland. Welcome, guys. We have any friends from Long Island out there? I can see Baron is joining us from Munich, and Eric Cecil greeting us from New York City. All right, I can see Blue Shirt Buddha. Hello, Tim, and everyone from Long Island. Cool. Represent. Guys, welcome. Let's talk a little bit about a watch that is equally grail-worthy, but comes from an entirely different end of the horological spectrum. Ultra low production. You think AP is low at 40,000 a year? Try 150 pieces. De Bethune. This is the De Bethune DB28 Digital. Based on the floating lug DB28 architecture, it actually changes its size and shape to match your wrist. 45 millimeters in diameter with a jump hour and wandering minutes across the top. What you're looking at is a barley corn or grand doge dial, guilloche cut, and then at the top, there is a semicircle comprised of blued grade five titanium, and everything that looks like a star in that night sky is hand polished and hand applied white gold. The same goes for the center. You're looking at grade five titanium that has been blued, and then at center, there is a 360 degree 
spherical moon face. One half is blued steel, one half is palladium, and it needs adjustment only once every 1,112 years. There's a jump hour just above, and you can see the scrolling minutes in the semicircular display atop. It's a little bit like an old lapine pocket watch or a bullhead. You could see that the crown is at 12 o'clock, or what would conventionally be 12 o'clock, and I'm going to show you how the jumping mechanism works. The hours scroll past, and then precisely on the hour, every 60 minutes, you get treated to a wonderfully dynamic little jump. Now this is a watch that has a wonderfully light feel on the wrist because entirely in grade 5 titanium, and with a large amount of, let's call it what it is, air comprising the physical area of the watch, you would think eyes closed, this is more of a 39-38 millimeter steel watch. The movement is just exciting. De Bethune twin mainspring barrel. Five to six day power reserve, five claimed, it'll run for six. You're looking at a gorgeous delta-shaped bridge for the barrels, twin barrels in series, self-adjusting. Note the balance bridge. It is itself blued, and a full bridge, you'll note, very shock-resistant, but supercharged with a triple parachute shock resistance system. So you have a spring on each side, a proprietary De Bethune spring system, and then you have a spring on the balance staff at center. So triple parachute, triple shock. A little bit like Breguet, but modern take. You'll also note that the balance is their own. It's a annular or circular balance with a silicon wheel and a white gold rim, and they went all all the way. It is their own hairspring with their own profile to ensure concentric beating with a flat hairspring profile. So you get the advantages of an overcoil, but you don't get the hooking risk of an overcoil. Also, their own silicon escape wheel. An absolutely sensational watch. I should probably show you this one on the wrist too. This is a watch that wears light and easy. Make no mistake, 45 millimeters in diameter, it's big, but it's also reasonably thin and fits well. It's only 13 millimeters thick in spite of appearances. A Submariner is 12.6, so this is not a girthy watch. It's just a watch that takes up a lot of surface area on your wrist. An absolute sensation, Denis Flageolet is the independent watchmaker maestro that you need to know. You know Philippe Dufour, you know Carrie Voudelainen, you know F.P. Journ. You need to learn about Denis. He is cool, he's a little bit of... I'd say a snob and a crank, but then again, so am I. Takes one to no one. The guy's a master. Okay, now jumping from the absolute height of high horology, I'm going, okay, here's a question. Eric Nielsen and Timmy rarely show yellow or rose gold in AP. Is that because you don't get them or because they move so quickly? I try to tailor these shows to more or less represent what I think you guys like. And I've got to admit, we don't often show colored gold on the channel. I've got some tonight, and I'm gonna probably aim for some colored gold AP in the future. Now that I know you're interested, I always thought you guys were the white metal crew. And speaking of which, this is one of the most interesting watches on the table tonight. Easily the most affordable and accessible piece we have. It's also one of my favorite. This is top three on the table for me. Vertical blue satin grain dial, day date with a bilingual day. It reads in German as well as English. This is the Mito Ocean Star day date. Now what makes this watch special? Well, first let's talk about its features. 80 hour power reserve, automatic winding, 300 meters water resistant. This is a watch that has a full deployant clasp with a push button incremental adjustment system. So a push button incremental system, a flip out extension, an all or nothing extension, hell no. This gives you the adjustability of Rolex glide lock, but with triggers to actuate it. It also features a trigger deployant clasp and every individual removable link is sized with a screw. Patek Philippe still uses pin sleeves as does Grand Seiko on its titanium bracelets. Now. I have to admit, guys, I overrated the water resistance of this one. It's 200 meters. All the same, you're getting a watch with an 80-hour power reserve, a bracelet that feels like it would belong at home on a $6,000 watch, and the same degree of fit, finish, and materials you would expect on a five grand watch for a retail price of 920. And we're asking considerably less for this one. We haven't priced it just yet, but expect to move in to a luxury level dive watch, lifetime serviceable, for some somewhere between $500 and $600. For $500, bucks, 600 bucks, it does not get any better than this. Let me show you this watch on the wrist. 42.5 millimeters in steel. 
Even the design of the watch is inventive with the orange and blue accents of the dial and the double index at 12 and 6. Take a look at that satin finish. It has a vertical brushing like you'll see on an Omega Apnea or on a Patek Philippe 5235. This is just a slick watch. It's less than 12 millimeters thick, which means it's thinner than a Submariner. And I would actually opt for this over almost anything else priced below seven grand. This is just an impressive watch. Mito blew me away with this piece. All right, guys, five, $600 and you get a luxury Swiss diver. There are micro brand watches designed to be thrown away that cost that much money. Okay, quick acknowledgement to our friends joining us from around the world. Uh, we got friends from Sweden, friends from Finland, London, Hollywood, Northern Ireland, and uh, question right here, Philip Hayden, where else on YouTube do you learn about Dave Bethune, Watchbox representing? As long as we've got it, you're gonna see it here. Our Goffberg branch is an authorized dealer. All right, guys, joining in, I can see Jason Reeves, Mark S, and right here we can say, Kim Bowden saying, more gold, yes, please, Rolex Sky Dweller, and Philip Hayden, uh, big fan of Mido, and right here I could say, Rich Buddy saying, it looks like an Omega, and you'll pay a couple thousand bucks for an Omega, and here's the real insider information. Having experienced absolutely everything, and believe me, just on this table, I've got everything from Mito to De Bethune. I can verify that the De Bethune and the Mito are equally appealing to me because while the De Bethune is high horology and exquisite, the Mito is the watch I would wear every day and for under a grand, you can't do any better. The Mito is unarguably best in class. At a hundred thousand bucks, the De Bethune has some competition. Okay, and right here I can see Andrew saying, I would love to see a rose gold Daytona. Manny Manster joining us from Chicago. And a shout out to Steve Hollick saying he knows Dave Bethune. Yes, yes he does, I would acknowledge that. He does know a lot of exotic stuff. And he's often selling his exotic stuff on the Watch Pro site collectors forum. Okay, boom. Simon Holt, a fan of the clasp on that Mito. He's got a crisp ward with a sliding clasp. I love all watches. I'm open-minded. And for that reason, I'm going to show you two watches that could not be any more different, both powered by the great Zenith El Primero caliber. In my right hand, the Tag Heuer Grand Carrera caliber 36 RS caliper chronograph of 2008, powered by a Zenith El Primero. And in my left hand, an early 2000s, late 90s, Zenith El Primero Chronomaster Chronometer Triple Date Moon Phase. This one is 40 millimeters in steel. This one is 43 millimeters in steel, but coated with titanium nitride. A lot going on inside these watches, but both of them beating away at 10 beats per second. Now, I will say, Zenith does display case backs right. It's almost like Tag is a little bit embarrassed to admit that it borrowed a caliber from its LVMH stablemate, whereas Zenith is loud and proud with the display case back on this caliber 410Z. Now this is one of the few chronometer certified El Primeros you will encounter. So is this, they're both COSC. Remember, the Daytona in the Rolex Zenith hybridized configuration. The Daytona with the Zenith made caliber 4030 was a chronometer El Primero, but it was a it was a four hertz eight beat per second El Primero. It was not the full fat version with the 36,000 vibration per hour beat rate. Either of these watches would be. Now you guys know what's going on here. Classic simplicity triple calendar. I need to explain the caliber chronograph because it's a little weird. Now, of course, before there was the Zenith El Primero striking 10th, everyone asked, what's the point of having a watch that can register one tenth of a second if you can't physically read one tenth of a second? Tag Heuer's solution was to create a caliper system. So what happens is you eventually stop the chronograph and then you align the red index of the caliper with the red end of the chronograph seconds hand. Finally, you look at this calibration on the caliper of one through 10 and you find Find the one that lines up perfectly with a white index of the dial, and that will tell you how many tenths of a second you have read. So you have your minutes, you have your hours, you have your chronograph seconds, and then you have the caliper telling you how many tenths of a second registered. It's a smart solution, a little bit weird, but once you learn how to use it, it is an absolute breeze, and it does work. That watch, by the way, was GPHG recognized special for the 2008 model year, coming out one year after the original Grand Carrera. Okay, jumping down, 
I can see right here Steve Bowden saying Tag Heuer needs to remove Tag from all their watches. I feel like they're going that way. Have you seen a lot of their reissues? Tag just isn't cool anymore. There might have been a time back in the 90s when Tag Heuer was the hottest thing you could buy at a booth in the middle of the mall, but let's face it, that mind share has been taken over by little places that sell cell phone cases. Today you want to move up market and if you've got a rich history like Hoyer does, you want to get in touch with that. And that's really what Tag needs to become if they want to be Hoyer into the future. Okay, right here, Kevin Wiltshire saying, Morning from Australia, Tim. I think finally Tag Hoyer are starting to up their game in terms of quality. I would say for sure, with the Hoyer O2 caliber, it is a very impressive machine. And I'll even mention that some of the watches powered by ETA calibers, like, for example, the reissued Monza, punch above their weight with higher levels of fit, finish, and material than you would expect. So keep an open mind. I'm still not a fan of most of the, you know, quartz style ladies watches they make. And frankly, most of their quartz men's watches don't have the same degree of interest to me that a Breitling Super Quartz or an Omega X33 or an Elegant by FP Journe would have. There is cool quartz out there, but I don't feel like Tag Heuer has a purchase on that. They'd probably be best off just dispensing with it. Jumping in, and I can see right here, there was a question about the hullabaloo surrounding the El Primero movement from Manny Manster. Basically, it's important for one reason. It was the first integrated high beat automatic chronograph. Seiko was first. I would say the Buren, Hamilton, Breitling, and Hoyer conglomerate with their caliber their original caliber 11 was probably second. Zenith was third to market an automatic chronograph, but they were the first with an integrated chrono with a high beat escapement. So that's important. Also, it survived since 1969. Not many movements can survive that long and remain at the top of the game and towards the top of the class. Okay, let's fly, guys, because we're behind. Let's talk about a watch that I think was probably the most underrated diver of 2017. This is the Blancpain 50 Fathoms tribute to mil spec. What is it? It's 40 millimeters. It's only 45.8 millimeters lug to lug, but it still has that gorgeous sapphire capped bezel that we love from the modern Blancpain 50 Fathoms. In 40 millimeters, this one is a tribute to the original mil spec one of 1957 to 1958. That became the mil spec two, which in US service for UDT and Navy seals became the Torneck Rayville. So this was the beginning of service issue Blancpain 50 Fathoms in the United States. Back in the late 50s, they had this moisture indicator that would change color if moisture got into the watch. This is still the same thing, and it is functional, but that's what that little twin semicircle is. It is a moisture indicator that a little bit like Zinn's copper sulfate capsule today changes color to let you know that something's going on inside the case. Very wearable on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist. This is a beautifully sized watch. If you can't stomach the 45 or 43 millimeter 50 fathoms, this is the watch for you. 500 pieces in stainless steel. It has something else the vintage watch has never had. A display case back over a movement truly worthy of it. Caliber 1151, four Four-day power reserve, free sprung balance, silicon hairspring, and a gorgeous palladium coated, dark palladium coated 18 karat gold winding mass. A beautiful piece that warrants the ownership of a loop if you buy this watch. And as you can see, it's just as nicely made on the dial side. Okay, jumping from the most interesting dive watch of last year to a family of dive watches that runs the gamut, the Omega Seamaster. How many different types are there these days? Even I seem to have lost track, but I can tell you I've got most of the main variants on the table. Let's jump back to the 1990s and the early 2000s, back when Omega was just picking itself up off the mat from the 80s and the quartz crisis and finding its stride courtesy of a partnership with James Bond. Now, both of these watches could be loosely described as part of the Bond Seamaster series. We usually say the Diver 300 is the Bond series, but the watch in my right hand literally is the Pierce Brosnan watch that he wore in his last three turns as Bond. Remember, GoldenEye was a quartz watch. This right here is the 253180, and I own a version of this watch. Chronometer certified, absolutely razor slim at 11.6 millimeters thick. This is a watch that really changed the way people looked at Omega Divers. 
Launched in 1993 in this shape, it's important to note this has been the most enduring Seamaster shape in the history of the model line. Rarely have they gone a quarter century without making wholesale changes. This watch celebrates its quarter century this year at Basel. Now this watch right here, a richer take on this early Diver 300. This is the chronograph but with full applique dial, and we're beginning to see mechanical upgrades inside the watch. This is caliber 3301 pre-coaxial, but with a 52-hour power reserve and a column wheel, it's an adaptation of a Valjoux 7750 to work with a column wheel and an extended power reserve while still giving you that tri-register classically balanced dial, not the off-center 7750 look. 41.5 millimeters in steel. This is a burly watch that nevertheless wears well on a small wrist. I might as well show you what I'm talking about. This is a 16 centimeter circumference wrist, and I gotta say though, this watch is 52 millimeters link to link. It's an easy one to wear, and it's a fantastic value in a no-nonsense luxury diver. You're getting a sophisticated movement that's been highly customized for Omega, as well as an iconic look with a dial that frankly is easier to read in the dark. This is the maxi style broadsword dial that debuted on the Seamaster 300 diver in 98 with the GMT. It quickly spread across the line. This is probably the most legible of the diver 300 meter dials. And with black and light indices, very easy to read in the light of day as well. Okay. I have more Seamasters for you guys. There were questions about rose gold earlier. Let's cut straight to the chase. I've got two fine takes on Omega GMTs, one from the Planet Ocean collection, one from Aquaterra. Both 43 millimeters, one's 43.5 in Planet Ocean form. The Aquaterra, this is a $19,000 retail coaxial chronometer with twin time zones. Red gold, 150 meter water resistance. It's the same movement that you'll find in this 43.5 millimeter Planet Ocean GMT. The only difference is this one is the 8615 with a full 18 karat rose gold rotor and 18 karat rose gold. Let me see if I can show you the balance bridge. That's right. 18 karat rose gold balance bridge. Both of them are hallmarked 18 karat. A remarkable refinement and a rich flourish on the inside of your Aquaterra. Notice this one, full bridge, free sprung, silicon hairspring, still tank tough despite the finery of the dial. The best way to describe this dial is that it's sort of champagne, somewhere between silver and rose gold. It does have a slight pink tinge to it and it is exquisite. Now, the Planet Ocean, white gold indices, white gold hands. This is the flagship of the Seamaster collection, 1200 meter Ploprof notwithstanding. What I like about this watch is that it was the debut platform for the Omega Seamaster 43.5 millimeter case, which is to say before 2016, if you wanted a Planet Ocean 43 and a half, you were getting the GMT. Ceramic GMT style bi-directional rotating bezel. This is a lot of watch for the money. And in steel, it's a tough piece as well. You'll also note the clasp, nice and Tough. The DNA of the 1990s Bond Seamaster is strong in this one with the all or nothing fold out clasp and trigger actuation, the clasp itself machined from the solid. Okay, jumping in right here, I can see uh, Gary Smith saying full gold watch, yuck. Yep, that is the reaction of some. That's why I have sparing exposure to gold watches, generally vintage when I show them on this show. And I can see right here, Philip Hayden saying, Omega in solid gold for me doesn't compare to the romance of gold Rolex. And then Amro asking, Tim, where is the Breitling? He always keeps me on track. Okay, quick though, Aunt G saying, Tim, any recommendations on a 39 to 40 millimeter chronograph? in precious metal for under $15,000. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I would say you probably want to look for one of these old Zenith El Primero Chronomasters. You can pick them up in gold. This is a 40 millimeter watch. You can pick up a caliber 410 Chronomaster from the late 90s in gold for exactly the price you're naming. And, and I would highly recommend this watch right here. I would also say buy one of the recent Zenith Chrono Masters. You can easily find them for under 15 grand and consider your options. You're gonna find that there are a number of Sedna Gold laced coaxial automatic chronographs from Omega in the Speedmaster family that really deserve your, your consideration. And hmm, I, I would say also Give a thought, if you will, to Breitling, because just about everything they make on a strap in gold, colored gold, is going to be available under 15 grand. If you can go big and you can go bold, and you've already decided on gold, consider a Breitling Chrono in the range you specify. Okay, jumping right now. 
to a fascinating watch from Breitling, and Amro asked, so I'm going to provide, this is the Transocean Chronograph. It's probably the best way to get into a compound complication. Let's list everything you get with this watch. You get a perpetual calendar, you get a moon phase, you get a chronograph, you get automatic winding, you get chronometer certification, and as you can see from the case back, water resistant to five bars with a screwed in case back. This watch is tough stuff. This is based on a Hale Hardy ETA core movement that you cannot destroy. Rich as stew and just as tough. This is a watch that you can wear and enjoy complications without having to worry about it being fragile or worrying about whether the boutique manufacturer that makes it is going to be around when you have it serviced. Now consider this. It is what's known as a 1461 or a Contiem B6 Teal Perpetual Calendar. So every four years, the Olympic year, you do need to adjust it. That's why there's no leap year cycle indicator on the dial. It is a very basic semi-perpetual that needs adjustment by you once every four years. But I think for most, that's enough. A chronograph, a chronometer, a moon phase, and a perpetual. That's a heck of a lot of watch to get for under 10 grand in stainless steel. Now, 43 millimeters is big, but I'm gonna tell you that 43 millimeters in a transocean is not excessive. Again, 16 centimeter circumference wrist, easy watch to wear. This is proof that there was both a pulse and a soul at Breitling prior to the arrival of Georges Kern. This is a watch that I would proudly wear. It's a fun piece to own and way under the radar. And to answer our previous question, yeah, I bet you could find one of those under $15,000 in gold on a strap but bigger than the stated size. That one's a 43. And right here I can see a question from Jason Reeves, perpetual calendar, semi-perpetual. Once every four years, you gotta make an adjustment. If you want the real Transocean perpetual calendar, they made 50 of them, we have one. Okay, and uh, Wiktor uh, S saying, Transocean are undervalued, everyone else is chasing old navvies. That's a fact. And Senor Jesus saying, thank God it doesn't have a display case back. It's true, the ETA doesn't give you much to see. Okay, speaking of a watch that gives you much to see, this is a watch that gives you much to see and much to hear. Let me start with the obvious. This is the Giger LeCoult Master Minute Repeater Antoine LeCoult. In case you're wondering what the heck just happened, I sounded a minute repeater at 12.59 and we moved the mic. No lav this week. Okay, quickly, let's take a look at this watch, one of 200 made in 2005. This was the first effort in earnest to produce a minute repeater. JLC had the Reverso repetition in the early 1990s. That was their first wristwatch repeater, but this one pegged the meter. 200 pieces, 44 millimeters in platinum. It has a 15 day power reserve. There's a torque meter that lets you know how much torque the mainspring barrels are putting out. And when you wind it, it disengages the torque meter. There's also a minute repeater with visible chimes, visible strike barrel, visible rack and snail on the dial side. Turn it over. The movement is made like a longa out of German silver or nickel copper zinc. The copper is what gives it that golden hue. And you can see engraved and ink, the reproduced signature of Antoine LeCoult, and they use ink in every character that's printed on the case back. You'll also note a full balance bridge and a free sprung architecture. So this is an everyday tough watch. You'll also note that longa style, the pivot jewels for the mainspring barrels are actually set in chaton. So the barrel arbors themselves are held in screw fixed chaton. All of the screws heat blued, not chemically dyed. Now turn this one over and I'm gonna sound it again, but I'm gonna let you see what's going on. So you can actually see the strike. We're past 12.59 now, so it's gonna be limited, but you'll see right there, that is the strike. And there is actually a welded gong. It's this little foot right here with the musical clefs on it, 
with the musical notes, I should say, that is where the gong is actually welded to the sapphire to transmit its sound into the sapphire, which is how a platinum minute repeater manages to be so loud. Normally, they're quite deadened. That was a monster. The year after, the titanium watch came out in the same case with the same movement. We have that watch too. All right, let's go from the top, high horology back to the bottom, the bottom of the ocean with Oris. This is a watch that I have to consider the most appealing dive watch under two grand, but above a thousand. Below a thousand, I can't compete with the Mito, but this gorgeous green ceramic bezel stainless steel Oris Aquas date has absolutely stolen my heart. Now you're getting a lot with this watch. You're getting a ceramic bezel with a superb tactile quality. You're getting a wonderful natural vulcanized rubber strap that has a scent of vanilla to it. It has screw fixed lugs, not spring bars here, or is sparing no expense. A wonderfully comfortable strap with evacuations on the underside to remove material and vent the wrist. It also features a wonderfully deluxe clasp. You have trigger release, twin trigger. You have a minderless system. Also note the double finished satin and perlage that tucks any excess clasp length, or I should say strap length under the clasp. So there are no minder loops on the strap. And it features a push button incremental adjustment system. So if you wish, you can make adjustments incrementally using a slider system rather than an all or nothing extension. This is a watch that retails for around two grand. And I believe we have this one priced for about $990. That is a hell of a lot of watch with a Swiss Salida SW200 movement. It's basically a Salida ETA2824. For under a grand, that is a wonderful watch from a wonderful brand and probably in its most attractive iteration. This is a 43.5 millimeter steel watch. And as you can see, I'm gonna throw this one on the wrist. It's wonderfully compact and comfortable. It's only 49 millimeters lug to lug, which means it wears well on a small wrist. And it's got a low profile. It's only 12.8 millimeters thick. So like a sub, this one can be worn with a suit, not just a bathing suit, a business suit. And one of the most colorful and lively dial bezel combinations you will encounter. Finally, one of the rarest watches you will ever find from the stable of Rolex Tudor. The timepiece on the table tonight was made briefly from October 2015 to roughly March 2016. A legend in its own time. This is the Tudor Black Bay Black, also known as the 79222N or the Black Rose. How do you know it? You'll know it by its sign. The rose symbol on the dial with the pre-chronometer script at six. The rose symbol means ETA caliber, and the pre-chronometer script means the same. Now this watch came out in October 2015. It was gone by March of 2016. Some have estimated that as few as 3,000 of these were made. The Black Rose is the most sought modern tutor from the recent era. Most of them have been produced in tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of copies. This thing is an absolute rarity. It's the combination of the black rose dial and the black bezel. And on a full pre skeuomorph rivet simulation bracelet, this one has no pretense of being a rivet bracelet. It's handsome, it's clean, and it's honest. I prefer this to the rivet style. You'll also note that less than 12 millimeters thick, you don't need to go with the Black Bay 58. This right here is as thin as a sub. So you don't have to worry about the thickness that comes with the Tudor in-house calibers. A certified modern day legend and an instant collectible. Folks who are into Tudor are into this watch. If you want something that your friends in the Rolex Tudor Club don't have, forget the Hulk, forget the Pepsi GMT. You want this. The Black Rose has the final say on the show tonight, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for suffering my new mic assembly. It actually worked out well. I thank my crew for making that innovation. Guys, remember, comment in the box below. If you're watching this recorded, I always respond to comments. And thanks again to all of you in the live chat box tonight. I always read your comments after the broadcast. Thanks again, guys. This has been Watches Live. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.